Okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay. If we have anybody online thumbs up or messages to Shanna is our tech support today. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kayla Elwood work with the Fort Bend County Sheriff's Office and kind of collaboratively with Behavioral Health Services. Um, so thank you for coming to talk about compassion fatigue today. Before we get too into it, I do want to introduce um, our special guest today is Gabriel. He is a comfort dog um, and Chaplain a Angle, did I say that right? Yep. Chaplain Angle. Um, so I will let them give an introduction. Um, and I'm sorry if you're on here virtually and you didn't come to class because you don't get the pets. <laughs> Can y'all see him okay on there? Okay. Uh, Chaplain, if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourselves. Glad. Good afternoon. I am Chaplain Tim Engel. I am Chaplain with the Harris County Sheriff's Office. And this is our church's comfort dog, Gabriel. I'm also pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church. Gabriel has been with us for a little over four and a half years, and he turns six at the end of March. He is um, my partner, and as along with other handlers, um, we could take him to hospitals, nursing homes, schools. I will take him to the Harris County um, 911 call center to spend time with the dispatchers there. Uh, and he is uh, a great source of comfort and, and encouragement for people when they're going through times of trauma, times of crisis, times of stress. Um, his job is to to be that that calming presence in a in a stressful situation and to bring love and comfort to folks. And he he does the heavy lifting. He's the one who engages people. And then I, as a chaplain or I, as a pastor, can follow up. But people come up to see him, and that opens up a lot of doors for conversations, a lot of doors for ministry. Um, he accompanies my wife and I when we run errands. So the folks at Sam's Club know him. The folks at Walmart, <laughs> all be they know him. So, so that's our friend Gabriel and some of the work that he does. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. All right, Gabriel, you're welcome to go do your job and roam while we uh, do our talking side on here. All right. All right, forgive me, you guys. This is my first time doing like this combination of virtual and in person. And I usually um, have a lot of energy and I tend to move around a lot. So I'm sorry if you have poor video quality. Um, I'll try to make sure I stay somewhat in front of the camera and the podium. Uh, but I do like to move around and kind of interact. Um, and hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, all right, so my story and a little bit about me and why I'm kind of here talking about this um, topic. Um, I've been with the Sheriff's Office for 12 years. Uh, eight, eight of that was actively on patrol. Um, the last three to four years, I took a in-office position, um, what we call intake, um, and it gave me an opportunity to have a break from the running call to call and the vicarious trauma um, on top of my own personal trauma. And um, I, so when I started patrol, I was really excited, really energetic. I got sucked into it, kind of had this identity loss from over-identifying because it's fun and exciting and an adrenaline rush and you're helping people and you're catching bad guys and you're going fast in cars. Um, but you're also seeing a lot and hearing a lot. Um, and in the beginning, um, when I started law enforcement in uh, 2010, uh, the culture was to put it away, right? Don't talk about it. We don't talk about this bad stuff. You just pretend like it didn't happen. And part of the reason I think that culture is because you go to one bad call and that's not the end of your ship. Then you go to another call, right? So you might go to something that's really traumatic. It might be a really, really terrible family violence situation. And you make an arrest or you take a report, you do the investigation, you clear that call, and then you go to the next one. And there's always something else holding in the community. And there is pressure to quickly respond as quickly as you can. And so you might go to a death of a child. And still, that is not the end of your ship. Right, you don't get to just like shut down and go home and call it quits. You still might have other calls for service that you have to respond to. And so it, while you have to do that so that you can do your job safely and effectively and kind of 
keep your emotions aside. We don't really teach when to let it out. And that can be really, really damaging. Um, about two years into my marriage, I married a police officer. We actually worked together on evening shift for a while. Um, so we're still successfully married. I would like to say, um, almost, almost going on 10 years now. So, um, about two years into our marriage, um, I started dealing with PTSD and even though I was already involved with peer support or our CISM critical incident stress management team, and I knew all these things and I would talk to all these other officers and the officers that I was training as a field training officer about, yeah, don't let this job, you know, get to you. You have to take care of yourself. And I would like always preach this self care and I wasn't doing enough of that. And I wasn't recognizing my own symptoms and I would try and like quiet them down because I would go to these scenes. And other people, I wouldn't see them be affected the way I was. And I felt, oh, maybe I'm not tough enough. Like, maybe I can't talk about it, right? So it ended up affecting me. It almost ruined my marriage, um, ruined a lot of friendships, probably affected my family relationships. Um, I became very withdrawn, um, angry, irritable, short tempered. Um, I wasn't the same type of FTO that I was when I started. Um, and I started, you know, noticing these things about me. Um, so when my husband and I had some conversations, we got to the point where we're doing a lot of arguing um, and the whole, well, you need to go to counseling. That's, you need, well, maybe we need to go to marriage counseling. It's not just me, it's both of us, right? And so I said, I'll make a deal with you. If you go to counseling, because you're having some like serious responses to what you're going through on patrol, when you get done with that, I'll go to marriage counseling with you. Okay, let's shake on it. So that's what we did. So I went through counseling. I also worked with um, a doctor who practices like lifestyle medicine, changed my diet, um, started doing some journaling, got back into like my fitness and exercising, prioritized my life goals. Um, and while I was in counseling, I talked to, to the therapist and she kind of asked, is this what you want to do forever? What do you mean? Like I'm a cop. Like when you go in to be a cop, like you think like that's the plan, like you're going to retire. So how do I, like, I didn't really think about what a backup plan was. And she was like, well, how long do you think you can take this, this toll on you? Because I was young. I was in probably 25 when I started um, experiencing uh, symptoms of PTSD. And um, so I was like, I don't really think about that. Like at the time I thought I'll be a street cop for maybe 15 years and then I'll apply for sergeant and I'll go to the training academy and I can teach. She's like, do you think you can make it 15 years? Do you think your marriage can make it for 15 years? You know, emotionally and physically, is that plausible for you? Crap, that's a good question. So I did some thinking, um, worked through therapy, worked through stuff on my own, um, did really well. At that time, I did not take any medication, although I'm not opposed to it. There's no shame. And if you get to a point beyond your regular coping skills, if you need medication from a doctor, kudos to you because it can be very beneficial at times. Um, so then my husband and I go through marriage counseling together because neither one of us are perfect and we're working through our stuff. And then I have this light bulb go off because I've been heavily involved in peer support. We started having a, a lot of um, critical incidents um, in our surrounding agencies. And I was like, I, how many other cops are out there feeling like I feel? How many other first responders are feeling this stress? I wanna change the stigma. I wanna do something. I wanna be a bigger part of SISM. I want it to grow. I wanna affect change. So I tell my husband, I said, I'm going to go back to school and I'm going to get my master's and I'm all excited. And he's like, okay, that's cool. Don't know what this is going to cost us, but what are you going to do with it? He said, I'm going to become a professional counselor. He's like, okay, for it's kind of trauma related still, but um, for, for who? And I was like, for first responders. He said, I'm going to get my LPC and our, our current, our LPC at the time, um, was getting older and she knew at some point, like, I'm going to have to pass this down to somebody. And so we had kind of discussed, like, this could be a good fit. So I'm like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to become an LPC and I'm going to become a clinical director for our system team at the sheriff's office. And, and, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to help first responders. He goes, so instead of going out and physically seeing all the trauma that's affecting you, you want to sit down in an office with a bunch of first responders and listen to their trauma. Yes. And you think that that's like, that's going to make you happy. Yes, it is, honey. Yes, it is. 
like, are you sure you don't want to be like open up a business? You could open up a dog rescue, right? Like he's trying to pull me out of law enforcement. And I was like, nope, maybe when I retire, that's another game plan. Uh, but I think that some of us and probably all of us in this room and all of us watching the presentation or who are online, we are, we're empaths as, as some of our clients say to us, right? Like we love people and we love helping people become happy and helping them find their purpose. And that's kind of just like who we are. And I don't think that I would really be happy in some type of job or lifestyle if I wasn't doing something that was helping others. Um, so that's my my journey. Um, I'm almost done with be, uh, becoming an LPC. Um, I take my exam on Friday. So woo, thank you. I'll take all the good vibes and prayers everyone has to send. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Um, so I have here for some of y'all at the ends of the deck, if you're here, we have some binder clips. So if you guys want to pass them down, um, everybody grab about a handful. If you are online, if you're at your desk or wherever you are, it's okay if you don't have binder clips. Um, if you have something tactile, some kind of object you can put in your hands, paper clips, a pen, pencil, um, highlighters, whatever you have, be creative. And I'll give you guys just a second. Thank you, Allison. Okay, so everybody has some. Okay, so I want you to get a handful. As many as you can fit in your hand. Okay, and I want you to close your eyes for a second. Okay, and hold them up in a ball and in, in, in your fist and close them in a fist and hold them up in your hand. Okay, and think about what they feel like. Now imagine that all these little things that you have in your hand are pieces of trauma. Some of it is your own. Some of it is from your clients. Some of it is build up over time from your profession. Okay. Now that trauma, the stuff that's in your hand is a pack of fireworks. And boom, it goes off. What does that look like? that explosion, you can go ahead and open your eyes. If I'm holding fireworks and this blows up in my hand, that's a bad situation, right? That is a lot of trauma that it's affecting. It's phalanges everywhere, right? Fing <laughs> fingers everywhere. So the point of this is to talk about a lot of us, whether it's our profession, maybe our culture, maybe our gender, how we've been taught to suck things up Suck it up, suck it up, suck it up, right? Especially men, we've kind of talked about that, like generationally, how we treat men and, and women differently from childhood. Um, different cultures deal with things differently about not sharing, not talking about things, not seeking mental um, help for their mental health. Um, and again, with our professions. So when we have these traumas, what we need to learn to do is to put our hand out. And as we get, you can go ahead and put your hand flat. And as we get, one or two, right? Client comes in, we see something, we experience something, whether it's our own, and it's something that shakes us up a little bit, or it's something that we hear about, we learn to dump it. We learn to keep our hand open, and we learn not to close up and hold it in and let it affect us. Because if the firework goes off, right, because sometimes stress does that, and we have one and we have our hand open, it's way more manageable, right? Like, maybe a trip to the ER, but probably not as much as if, if we did this, right? Um, so that, if you can keep that in mind um, as we kind of go along um, the presentation, um, because I've been there when, when this happens and it's ugly and it impacts more than just you and it's really hurtful. So if I can help encourage anybody else to learn to do this and that this is okay and this is acceptable and this is what it takes for us to all change the stigma, um, then please, please keep that in mind. Okay. So 
Compassion fatigue is an occupational hazard of any professionals who use their emotions, their heart. It is the psychological cost of healing others. It's like a dark cloud that hangs over your head, goes wherever you go, and invades your thoughts. Um, those are words from Charles R. Figley, PhD in the Traumatology Institute at Tulane University. He actually coined the term compassion fatigue. Okay, so a little bit more about it, because um, I really, um, until Dr. Almeida asked me to start to do this presentation, I really had to look into it and see okay, what is the difference between these terms, between vicarious trauma and burnout? Because I immediately associated when she said compassion fatigue, I was like, oh yeah, that's burnout. Like every mental health professional and first responder knows that, we get it. But there's actually a little bit of a difference here. Um, so for vicarious trauma, it'd be experiencing secondary exposure to clients' trauma, negative responses and emotions from helping others um, through empathetic work, impact on, it has an impact on personal beliefs and your own world view, and there's cognitive disruptions that carry beyond the scope of work. So when we're looking at compassion fatigue, um, we're looking at these things that we're doing at work that are affecting us beyond just at work. It's coming home with us, right? It's affecting how we think 24 seven, how we feel, how we interact uh, versus burnout, um, which is usually a slower buildup of exhaustion and lack of motivation in work, uh, feeling that your work has little or no impact, uh, typically stems from occupational stress and feeling overworked and can usually be improved by um, changing like your work assignment or a profession if needed. Um, the term secondary traumatic stress um, is another term for compassion fatigue and um, it mirrors symptoms like post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress disorder, just a little bit less as intense. Um, empathetic strain and general exhaustion from caring for trauma survivors or people in distress. So, um, has anybody here um, in this room ever, if you feel comfortable sharing, feel like at some point, it doesn't have to be right now, <laughs> at your current, yeah, me right now, right now, I feel like I have this. Um, but does anybody, is this relatable to anybody? Like, have you ever felt that? Yeah. And what what was something that you you found worked for you? Well, I wasn't going to not, before I say what works, one of the things that I feel like, um, I had one, I have a lot of clients, I'm very hard, get very invested. I had a young man who very, very invested in and built rapport, not just with him, but with his family. And um, he had been sober for a little over a year. Uh, we've gotten him into a great program and love it. Came back, was doing great, had a job, had a girlfriend coming to see me all the time, interacting with him and uh, the family, but just really built a, built a strong rapport, not just with him, but the entire family, but he ended up relapsing. And as you know, when people relapse, they think they have to use the same amount of Xanax or the same amount of whatever right. they used to, you know, 18 months prior. And um, it cost him his life. And it cost him his life not only because he drugs, but the family in their loving and nurturing and protecting didn't get into a hospital they should have. And he lost his life, but I feel like I'm still carrying about 25 pounds on from that trauma. Absolutely. It was so, I've had other traumas still that affect me and loss of life for clients. Yeah. But that one in particular was just, um, I just didn't see it coming at all. Like no clue and felt like it was so, Preventable, and when you build a bond, when you begin to love and care about people, absolutely, you greatly. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like, unfortunately, it becomes the cost of being genuine yeah. and putting, you know, your heart into your relationships with your clients and taking care of others, whether that's, you know, kids, babies, adolescents, adults, um, maybe it's people at home that you're caring for. Maybe you have an elderly parent um, and we, we experience that you know, pain and heartache on the outside of it because we just care so much. Um, it is it is really hard to deal with. So I'm very sorry for, for his loss, um, but I'm glad that you're here. Thank you for coming. Okay. Yes. Um, burnout, um, clearly something that a lot of people, a lot of us might be experiencing or have experienced in the past. And, you know, it's interesting because you can feel like, Exhaustion 
chapter of the shortage of workforce and, and in the work that we do is pretty common. Um, I, I, and it's interesting because often then burnout, you know, we, we feel that our work has impact. Right. right. And, and so it's like, okay, you know, I'm exhausted, I'm working really hard, but we're making a difference. And um, and I think that's that's often the balance. That's often one of the protective factors. For right. That you have to be really cautious about that because it's sort of like you're exhausted, you feel like you're not making a difference. Right. Same thing. Um, that's what really, you know, I have to pay attention. Right. So finding the time to reflect on. Okay, I am making an impact. I am valued and it's not just going to waste. Um, and I think being able to sometimes having the affirmation, whether it be from like your colleagues, your peers, um, your um, supervisors of that you are recognized um, because when we were con we didn't join any of these jobs to get thank yous all the time, right? Like none of us did. We didn't do it to make a bunch of money and we didn't do it to get a bunch of thank yous. So we do it because we care and. Sometimes you need that recognition that you are valued and you're appreciated and, you know, collectively as like a department, but also individual that your, your work going in is being recognized. Um, and so finding ways to, you know, reflect on like, hey, we are, we're making an impact here, a positive impact on people's lives here. And it does matter. And maybe I know you're a data person. <laughs> so, like, you're like, how can I measure that? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So somebody that at risk of life, you know, relapse. Yeah, because you're dealing with it on the longer end, right? So when the first responders come in contact, it's it's at the initial crisis, right? And then the mental health professionals are dealing with it on a long term type of care, and that's where a lot of the the change is affected. Susan, I know for uh, for me, I have to recognize when I'm starting to hit that burnout phase because of doing this for so long and listening to traumas all day long, every single day. And then I'm telling these clients, okay, these are the skills and stuff that you have to be doing. Eat right, sleep right, move right, do all that kind of stuff. And then here I am not doing it myself. Right. right. And that's yeah. the first thing to say, wait a minute. And so I've always told clients, and I still to this day try to practice what I preach, is that if I'm not willing to do the same things I'm telling you to do, then it's not going to be effective. So that's Absolutely. how I kind of recognize for myself to say, okay, wait a minute, let's take a look at the last week. How well have you been sleeping? Um, you know, you know, or like how heavy is your workload? How many this do you have? Or like um Days when you have clients that come in and they are suicidal yeah. and you have to work on getting them into a place and then all of a sudden you don't know the after effects. Are they going to come back to you because you had to have them right. on an EDO or something like that? So it's, you know, being able to be very self aware of, you know, when am I hitting these things? Absolutely. And I know we've talked about that in your office several times. Um, Susan has been one of my um, supervisors during my um, clinical periods while I was working um, towards my LPC. And so we have talked a lot about that. It's like, man, like that was some heavy stuff my client just shared with me or you're telling them to do these things for self care. And we're like, wait, are we are we doing those things for ourselves or are we just kind of preaching and then not practicing it and not leading by example? Um, did anybody else have anything? Any onlineers? No. Okay. All right. So who is at risk? It's probably more easily stated who is not. <laughs> um, so let's start off um, with our military, right? In the middle um, military, right? Constantly exposed to trauma. Some of it they're maybe um, experiencing firsthand. Some of it maybe they're seeing they're going into these other countries um, where other people are mistreated and children and women are mistreated. And there's times where they can't do anything about that. And it has to be a very, very hard thing to deal with when um, we have these very strong beliefs and, and equality. Um, and so they come back home with it. Um, I know that that the VA and everybody's trying to do better about um, PTSD and having the aftercare and trying to help 
um, kind of retrain them when they come home uh, from combat because it's like we do so much training to get them ready to go off to war and what do we do to help them when they come back home. Um, so definitely then that's the first thing that I think about. Um, we also have our, um, our call takers, our dispatchers. They are hearing it. They're constantly all day. So our dispatchers are on 12 hour shifts. They're either 6A to 6P or 6P to 6A. Um, and they're in this big, dark, cold room with computer screens everywhere. And it's very isolated. And they're for hours on end, either answering the calls for the trauma or listening it to it over the radio. And maybe they have something really high priority happen, like an officer involved shooting. And they're right, somebody keys up, officer involved shooting, officer, officer down, officer down, call EMS, right? Call get life light on standby. And then the panic that happens in that room with these men and women not knowing who was it, who just keyed up, who's on scene. Do the supervisors know? I've got to call, go through a checklist. I got to call this person, this person. I need this much information so we can call the sheriff and the chief. It is so intense and stressful. And that's for the big scale stuff. But even the things that comes in daily, CPR in progress, children crying and screaming, domestic violence, our, our poor call takers, they frequently just get verbally abused over the phone. We'll have people call up there and cuss them out and talk about how much they hate police in the sheriff's office and make threats towards, you know, towards our whole uh, de department and towards all of Fort Bend County. Um, and so it can be really, really brutal for them. Um, and then they get stuck with the audio when they go home, right? They're not seeing it. They're kind of imagining what's going on in our scenes, but they're hearing it and that gets stuck. Um, then we have uh, the picture of the officers running. That's actually a picture of the office police officers in Las Vegas when there was the shooting from the hotel um, where a gentleman shot was an active shooter um, during a concert. Um, so that's them running into that. Um, Another one of the first responders um, that was outside of Santa Fe, uh, the one with the fire trucks and the ambulance. That's their response whenever there was the school shooting at Santa Fe. Um, and, you know, all of the things is there's a lot of little calls that we all go to, but then there's these big horrific ones. Um, and then also our medical staff, like doctors and nurses. And I know sometimes so in law enforcement, we kind of joke when we talk about like PTSD and anytime somebody brings up, oh yeah, well, what about medical? And they're like, no, they make money. They don't, they don't get to have problems. They don't get to have PTSD because they make too much money for it. But that, that's not true. We know that it's our own way of like being in our own little subculture um, and feeling like we're special. But um, we know that, that that's not true. Imagine, right? Like these surgeons working on children for hours and hours and then the children does the child doesn't survive, right? And how heartbreaking for the entire team of people to deal with that. So um, that's somebody else that I think about. Um, then we have um, our people who are in contact with children, uh, CPS workers, our teachers, um, especially in uh, maybe lower income school districts where we have an increase at risk for um, different variables that could affect them. Um, and being exposed to um, maybe like more violence or something. So not specifically family violence, because we do know that it doesn't matter. Family violence is everywhere. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic status, your, your culture, your race, your gender, it affects everybody. Um, but if there's higher rates of crime in the area that they live in, they could be exposed to that. Um, parents, you know, going to jail, um, that type of exposure. Um, our juvenile division, um, the Child Advocate Center, um, and our special crimes investigators. Um, they work with a lot of um, crimes against children, sexual assaults, human trafficking, stuff like that. Something I would not be able to sign up to do. Um, too, too heavy for me. Um, I know that personally, I would bring way too much of it home and I'd probably turn into like a vigilante. So, <laughs> so Sheriff Fagan, if you're watching, please don't ever try and send me a special crimes. <laughs> Um, next, we have um, our courthouse, um, our judges listening to these cases in these heavy cases that maybe special crimes is bringing to them, right? The judges, the attorneys, the bailiffs, um, the additional court personnel doing the typing. I'm sorry, can't think of their the court, reporter. court reporter. Thank you. Their official name um, are jurors that can be when they're on these like 
long trials that are going on and on and having to see the pictures and the evidence and this and that is that can be really hard. Um, and also our, our DA investigators that are here. Um, of course, we have our mental health professionals, which we have a room full of um, counselors, our psychologists and psychiatrists, our social workers, our crisis line operators. Um, if there's anyone I left out, please let me know. But I think we got that one covered pretty well. Okay, so what does it look like? At work, we might be experiencing irritability, uh, poor job satisfaction or performance, feeling undervalued, um, detached from our colleagues, not socializing as much. Like you used to be that person that would, hey, let's go to lunch on Fridays. And now all of a sudden you're not like wanting to do lunch. Like I'm just bringing my own thing and sit in my office, eat by myself. I've got work to do. We know you're just on Amazon Prime ordering stuff that you don't really need. <laughs> Um, negative feelings towards the caregiver relationship um, and impatient with clients or colleagues and also just kind of being impatient with yourself. Um, at home, uh, some of the physical symptoms we might experience would be headaches, physical and emotional exhaustion, weight loss or weight gain. Does anybody in this room get weight loss when they're stressed out? Because I get the gain part and I want to know how to switch it. It's it's always the gain right to the gut where all that cortisol is, is dumping and then it just sticks around. And as you age, it gets harder to get rid of. So hydration can help with that, right? Trying to flush out those, those chemicals that we don't want lingering. Um, poor sleep, diminished concentration, uh, detached or withdrawn. Uh, negative impact on interpersonal relationships, right? Like not interacting with our kids as much as we normally do or being um, kind of just cranky with them for no reason. Um, we're doing that with our spouses. Okay, and along with our identity, um, feeling helpless, hopeless or powerless, um, feeling a loss of purpose or meaning, Losing sight of the good in the world and having this negative outlook, right? That everyone out there is is bad. They're all predators, um, especially if you're dealing with a lot of like violent types of things um, and just kind of not trusting anyone in the world because you see so much bad and so much ugly. Uh, lack of motivation for hobbies. So what can we do about it? And take control over it. And we can do that by first off being aware of the symptoms. So I mean, it's stuff like this and remembering it and being able to assess in your own self when you're actually experiencing those things. Um, recognizing that you're not immune. So I can tell you if this vest didn't make me immune to the stuff that I saw on the street, there's nothing that mental health professionals have access to that's going to protect you from it. We're human beings. We have hearts and emotions. It's going to hit us at some point. And hopefully we're doing this and not this. Okay. Um, so make self-care a routine. And I have some little handouts. So for anybody online, if can they jump ahead in the PowerPoint? Or Shanna, could you jump ahead for me? Oh, okay. Um, let me see. If I jump ahead to 19. Okay, so if we jump up to here, if you're online, sorry, I didn't have a way to get this to you ahead of time. If you have a printer, you can click on those images. Um, they copied in like a photo and you could print those out if you have access to a printer. Um, but everybody here, I'm going to go pass out. You guys and gals get to start a self-care worksheet.
Okay. Do, um, does everyone have pens or pencils? I have some at the back by Veronica if you need a writing utensil. Okay, so um, I'm going to give everyone um, a couple of minutes, let's say about three minutes. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to do the current practices. And so go down the list, starting right, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. Um, what are the current practices that, that you do right now? And if you have none, right, be honest with yourself. This is for you. You don't have to turn this into me or anybody else. This is just for you to kind of start assessing where you're at and what you're doing currently. Yes, Faye, I want you to fill that out. <laughs> <laughs> You got another minute and a half, and I'm going to go see Gabriel while y'all are doing that. This is just a turn. Give a few more seconds and see some people still riding. Take your time, no rush. Thought ahead, I would have put like some music, some background music in here. Okay, so you don't have to, but is there anything on there that anybody wants to share with what their current practices are for? And it doesn't have to be every single point, but is there something that you want to say that you currently do or that you are aware that you you don't do and you need to implement something? All right, come on. Well, I realized that on the physical, I just remember that I'm always arguing with my husband when we ask him to go out for a brief walk. 
For sure. What? Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that because it is, it's so easy to get wrapped up in what we're doing at work and our immediate family and just trying to, as Shanna said earlier, I'm just trying to survive, man. And I was like, how are you doing? I'm still surviving. Me too. It's like, is it Friday yet? It's, and I don't know if it's just been this year, the last couple of years, the buildup with COVID and the economy. And it just seems to be like a really stressful time for everyone. Um, and especially this month of May mental health month, right? Like it is I, more people are coming forward, more people are having crisis. Um, I know Susan and I sometimes are like, oh God, we got another one every day. Um, and it can present its challenges when you're trying to engage in your self care. So definitely making the time um, to say, what is a priority in my life? And maybe I'm, I'm stressing too much about my workload and, and there's some other things that can make me happier when I am at work. Dr. Almeida. So I'm gonna talk about work. And that seems to be one of my biggest stressors. So usually it's, and, and I have to really focus on this, focus on what I can accomplish and what can be accomplished. Check off what got hit on. So, yes. you know, since the list is never that. But Absolutely. I make a point to check off what was completed. Always had a plan B, and now I have to have a plan C. <laughs> and, um, and I think also, and for me, this has really been something, is like really don't personalize it. Um, you know, so it, it like it gets staff me. I just take it really personal. Right. And I think there's just so many factors right now with staff turnover and and just the workforce. So it really it, it's really become a protective factor of not personalizing. Absolutely. I think um, we can all be a little bit guilty about that when we love something and including our profession and then we get somebody new and we're excited and then they're, they're not feeling it and we're like offended by it, right? Like, how can you not love it as much as I love it? Why don't you see it? This is amazing stuff here. What is wrong with you? Get out. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that. Say. Physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, all of the above are exercising. Exercise, which is a good one. That's usually my go-to. Kill myself every day. In your workouts. Yep. <laughs> and I've been prioritizing to go to the chiropractor. I keep maintaining my body, not just physically exerting it. Right, absolutely. That that actual medical care and going in and doing your regular checkups when you're supposed to and when you're sick, right? Going to the doctor when you need to, if your symptoms are lingering longer than normal. And it's annoying to make time for that sometimes. Um, but it's really, really important for sure. Anybody else before I move on? Okay. Sorry, y'all getting to see my slides ahead of time. We don't have too much longer. I'm trying to get there in the hour. Okay, so we already talked about taking control of it. Y'all did the worksheet and breathe, smile, repeat. Okay, so a few little things. So as you start to think about what are some ways that you can practice and you can fill your stuff out as, as we talk through the presentation if you want to, or you could save it for later. Um, spending time in nature has been linked to cognitive benefits and improvements in mood. Um, it really should be for longer periods of time, um, like forest bathing. I know Susan is a big fan of right? like really being in, submerged into nature, um, but that's not always possible, right? And we work in all these big cement buildings, um, but sometimes if you can just go get like a five minute break outside and just sip your coffee, eat a snack, walk, go use, you know, at Fort Bend County, we have this trail back here. Um, I, you know, a couple times a week, if I can, it's not too hot. <laughs> um, we'll go and either just sit or walk. Um, but just get outside time or trying to do it when I'm at home and hanging out on the back patio or going on a run, doing something outdoors. Um, bond with your fur babies for an increase in oxytocin. 
That is true. Um, so that's why we have Gabriel here to help increase the moods, get some oxytocin in your system, making you feel like you're happy feeling. Um, babies can also give us that. They can also stress us out sometimes <laughs> when they're cranky or crying. Um, but animals are a great, great um, tool for that. And then um, exercise releases endorphins. It boosts natural energy levels and improves symptoms of anxiety or depression. So if you're feeling really like stuck and lethargic, and we're like unmotivated and, uh, and you know, oh, going to the gym and doing a workout just sounds exhausting. Even doing five minutes of exercise, a little short circuit at home, going on a walk, um, even when we don't want to, we usually feel better after we do it. It doesn't have to be a huge exhaustion like Faye killing it at the gym every day, right? Heavy lifting, just doing something to get your body moving. Okay. So play, create, write, be creative. Um, musical instruments are a great idea. Music is, can do wonderful things. Engaging in ways to be creative encourages the brain to change functions and to release dopamine. And the dopamine is something that helps you feel better. So cortisol is a stress chemical. Um, we release that when we're really stressed out. Dopamine can help us feel a little bit better. Um, creativity allows your brain to stop running with those wild intrusive thoughts by focusing on a task. Does anybody besides me, and actually I know two other people in this room, have a coloring book that they keep at work? Yes, yes, I love it. Um, so that's something simple, right? Like you're stressed out, you just dealt with a really challenging situation or client, um, you feel like you can't take on any, any, any more, you know, like, okay, it's raining outside, so I can't go get my five minutes, pull out a coloring book with some matte pencils and just I turn on some music, get my jams on, and I just sit there and color like a little kid. But it helps calm me down and something by your brain focusing on doing something, you know, artistic or creative stops all of those, that loud noise that the, you know, intrusive thoughts and negative things. And socialize, make the time for your family and your friends, uh, set a new goal for yourself. Look for a change up at work, like moving positions to see if there's potential for a promotion, uh, take a new training that you're interested in. Um, if you've been doing, finding yourself doing the same exact thing every time, find some way to, to change it so it's not so repetitive. Um, plan a trip, plan for retirement, uh, consider talking to a mental health professional yourself um, and consider the need for possible medication um, if it gets to a point where you feel like you're really not dealing with it on, on your own. Um, as I said, no shame in, in taking medication as it's needed. And find your purpose. That's mine. My little munchkin, that little smiley face. I live for that. Um, that's why I do everything that I do do. Um, and I try to make sure that when I come home, I come home with the same expression, right? I come home as a happy mom and not an angry mom, not an irritated mom, not a stressed, I'm too tired to play with you, to interact with you. Um, so find whatever your purpose is. Maybe it's, it's maybe you don't have little kids. Uh, maybe it's, and maybe it's just for you. Maybe you just need your own purpose and your own type of balance in your life. But for me, mine is definitely my family because I know that it in the past has affected my marriage with my husband. So I want to make sure that I'm not doing that same thing again. And really, I want to make sure that I'm not doing that to my daughter because she deserves the best mom that I'm capable of being. So that I think is pretty much all I have. Um, that is my contact information. So if anybody needs anything, you ever have any questions, you want to share something, um, please feel free to reach out to me um, by phone or by email. Um, and actually, for those of you doing the worksheets, I will give you a 30-day challenge. So in 30 days, if you want me to, because I'm not going to start harassing people and get complaints filed on me, if you want me to, you can send me, um, we can either do a list in here or you can send me an email and um, give me permission to contact you. And I'm gonna check in on you from 30 days and see what you've done, what you were currently doing at the time of this. And then in 30 days, what you have been doing and what's changed and making sure that holding you accountable, right? And also myself included, I will also fill one out um, so that we can share back and forth. 
Um, but you, if you're online, you can shoot me an email um, and I'll mark you down and I will contact you. Okay, any questions? Anybody need anything? Questions. However, I'm currently working on making your weekly self care okay. uh, survey. Sorry, I'm still so guilty when I have to say survey. So that way the people online can participate. So okay. I'm updating it. That way they get awesome. You know, awesome. Awesome. You know, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, online attendance. Yeah. 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 Yeah.